Alex Lightman is an author, entrepreneur, futurist. He has made significant contributions to so many different areas. Like I've been following his um, his his view into the coronavirus issue uh, from from the beginning, and he really has a theory and an understanding that very few people do have because he actually read a lot of the scientific papers that came out of China in the beginning and. He's been following what's going on. So stage is yours, Alex. Great. Thank you. Can you all see me? Oh, yeah. Uh, and here as well. Okay. Good. Okay. Because uh, the little uh, tiny thing in the upper right isn't showing me, because I can see my slides on one and my picture on the other. Hello. So I'm going to talk to you today about 10 things to do, uh, 20 things and more to do to survive to 2022. There are 632 days between now and January 1st, 2022. And the idea is that um, I wanted to take a longer time perspective on this because I feel that at these Trump press conferences and a lot of what uh, government officials are saying all has to do with the next one week, two weeks. How do we get out of this? Take hydro, hydroxychloroquine and then everything will be gone like a miracle. And the reality is that uh, our genome mutated 1% in the last 8 million years. This uh, SARS-CoV-2, which could also be called SARS-CoV-WIV2, uh, is something that is mutating 1% today. And I've seen people talk about as many as 340 strains. We don't even know. The other thing is that, and you can differ, this doesn't make any difference to my presentation, but I have seen evidence in the words of the creators that this is uh, a gain of fun a dual use gain of function uh, that was developed. I mean, both China, the US, not to mention other countries have spent billions of dollars on bioweapons. And so we shouldn't be surprised if things uh, escape from labs. I do think this was a lab leak. And so what that means is that at any moment, uh, there could be more of these at any time, because there's a, all kinds of games that are afoot. So the idea is not to relax after a week or two or a month or two, or even three months, but to just say, okay, for the next 332 days, I'm going to come up with a plan, and I think that this should be part of your plan. Okay, so the outline, I'm going to talk about testing. I'm going to talk about society and community. I'm going to talk a lot about oxygen, antiviral measures, nutrition, antiviral coatings, and supplements, and biohacking. And also, this was meant to be the last talk, and it was meant to be a bit of a summary. So there will be overlap, but I'm going to be coming at it from a, a kind of a different angle. I think the speakers have been great. I've learned a lot and enjoyed this, uh, what I've seen. So the, uh, the basic idea is test and test and test. We have only about uh, 200,000, one out of every 200,000 people has been tested so far. And you see, if you keep track of the testing numbers, you can have a, a bit of a bullshit detector because in the United States, we have now 30 million doses of hydroxychloroquine, but we've only done 2.2 million tests. So I have a concern and I've had many people on Zoom calls uh, call me up and say, oh, look at this. I have my hydroxychloroquine and my remdesivir and I have the Cuban drug. And so I think that we're going to have two big problems. Um, I, I think it's worth noting that the number one cause of death in the United States has been heart disease, about 26% of people, then cancer at 24. And uh, about, uh, about 600,000 people die uh, uh, each year in America of cancer. But the number three cause of death is medical mistakes. Now, up until 2020, we could say, well, those medical mistakes are all the fault of doctors, nurses, hospitals, all that. I think this year we're going to have a spectacular increase because of self-medication. I think the, the biohacker community suddenly is going to find itself in a very unusual and different position where you have to, where before uh, we were saying, oh, let's try this, let's try this. But now I think when we understand systems and how things fit together, we have to warn people who are eager to self-medicate because you can't become a biohacker by seeing Donald Trump say, oh, take hydroxychloroquine, and then suddenly you know how to do it. You know as much as a doctor because a person who is uh, weighs 50 kilos doesn't need the same amount of medication for every medication as somebody who's 250 kilos. Do you have obesity? Do you have asthma? Do you have these complicating factors? So I think that we're going to end up having to offer advice and to slow people's role to keep them from doing that. So testing, that what before the testing had to do with, did you have 
uh, tests. So I've had tests. Uh, I, I stopped breathing back on May four, uh, March 14th, and I was tested. And the test for COVID-19 had to go to CDC. They didn't tell me for five days. So I had to actually march over to UCLA and give them a hard time. And I even traded a box of donuts to get my test results, which came on a piece of paper. So the testing, though, that's really going to matter is for antibodies. And I also don't know that how long those antibodies are going to last. I don't know if they're going to work for all strains. I don't think they will. And I think that it's quite possible that governments who have these other kind of things that are COVID-like, because uh, Zheng Li, she shared her SARS-CoV WIV-1 with other laboratories. So multiple people have the related kind of coronavirus that's here and could just drop them and people would say, oh, that's just a mutation of the coronavirus. So you want to try and get that antibody test. I know uh, I have a friend who's getting a bunch of these tests, but that's one of the things that biohackers are probably going to be the main line of distribution for. So if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And a big problem with this is unclear cases. So hospitals are testing for lots of things, but in some cases, like in the US, and that may have changed, but when I was getting my test done, and this was only three weeks ago, they could measure everything at the hospital, but then they had to send it off to the CDC to measure it. And uh, we have a big, we have multiple problems. One is not enough tests. Uh, two, people can uh, have false positives. Three, they have false negatives. And four, people can go and survive this and then get reinfected later. And so the idea is that you want to be able to test yourself on a fairly regular basis. And one of the things uh, that will come up with a, a, a very simple test that you can buy, it used to be buy for $20, but now it's for $60 uh, that you can use. And a friend of mine just used it this morning and asked me about it. So we have to th think about uh, social isolation. Social, uh, social isolation is a double-edged sword, and other people have talked about this too. So on the one hand, you want to stay at home as much as possible. But on the other hand, there are many people who find their immune system plunge they, uh, if they are away from other people, because a lot of us get our sense of self, our sense of confidence. And just like we, have, we see hints of the importance of body, mind, heart, soul, spirit connection. So one thing is that placebo works uh, an increasing number of times. I've seen studies that say placebos work 28% of the time. The most I've ever seen is that placebos work 38% of the time. Well, the idea of if you're if you have this subconscious, if you have a lot of, of issues, if you have a lot of stuff that you haven't worked out, you had a traumatic childhood, you're afraid of abandonment, you have abandonment issues. Uh, you know, my mother moved out uh, from, from being with me when I was uh, 13 years old and got her own place and I had to work myself. So I have abandonment issues. And this is really uh, stressful for me. But uh, social isolation with, uh, uh, with or without loneliness can have a large effect on mortality risk, as large an effect on mortality as smoking, obesity, a sedentary lifestyle, and high blood pressure. And so I think that what uh, Timo and his colleagues in this community are doing, creating a community here, is very valuable. It is a biohack. The video conferencing in this day and age is a biohack. So another thing that, that is very, very useful in this is to uh, occupy your time asking people what's happening to them and then documenting their stories and getting them to document their stories because we are living in historically important times. Just like we can go back and look at the experiences of people uh, who are working and, and living and dying and you know caring for people in the great influenza epidemic, which is falsely called the uh, Spanish flu because that originated also in China. Uh, you know, when 50 to 100 million people died out of 1.8 billion, uh, community was very important to those people, and it's part of it. So uh, the idea is, uh, you know, my neighbors have met with each other and said, "Look, do you need anything?" They they wear masks. So we have to wear masks even in the building. So I'm not allowed to walk out of my apartment and into Santa Monica. I have to be wearing a mask, even if I'm in the stairway, the elevator, anything. But people are asking each other, "How are you doing? Do you have everything you need?" And then also, I try to uh, make at least uh, 10 phone calls a day, just checking in with people, various people. And I basically want to, uh, uh, to make sure that people are okay. Uh, you're, I have my contact information at the end. If you're feeling bad, especially if you're feeling suicidal 
or you're feeling really terrible, you're welcome to call me and I will, I'll do my very best to make time for you. And the other, also, we have to look out for people who perhaps don't speak our local language in America if they don't speak English so well, or if they're elderly, or if they're people who are blind. Uh, blind people are already having a big problem. They have a 70% unemployment rate. Or people who are deaf, we have to, you know, if within the calls that you make, within the contact that you're making, if you can think of a disabled person, uh, I think something like 50 million people in the U.S. have a disability of some kind. So also the idea is that you want to uh, keep track of, uh, you have ask people to write down their health history. So what kind of diseases have they had? And it's really important, for instance, if they've had malaria before, or if they know that they have, uh, they, they have asthma. Uh, I have had asthma. I haven't had it for 25 years, but for some reason, maybe it's all this RNA, maybe it's just psychosomatic. I've suddenly seen the return maybe once or twice a week of my asthma. And there are all kinds of uh, websites for doing this, like Cure Together. And I think it's highly important for you to have your story ready and then to give uh, help other people tell their stories as well. Here's a question I normally ask people, and, I've, and I'm giving the answer, so I'm not asking you this question, but I ask people, what element on the periodic chart of the elements are you mostly made of? And the answer is oxygen. By mass, you're 60% oxygen, you're 18% carbon, you're 10% uh, hydrogen, and you have, you're made up of 54 elements. The element you're least made of, but it's really important as it turns out, is selenium. So you want to make sure that you take care of these things. But oxygen is the most important thing of all. And the idea is that you want to increase your hemoglobin. Uh, now, it says run as much as possible. In many cases today, unless you live in a forest and you're around other people and you're not in lockdown, because more than half the world is on lockdown now, you want to have a treadmill. But you can get treadmills relatively inexpensively. You can get them for $300, $400. All the prices have gone up, but a treadmill is well worth it. And even if you're just running a little bit, it does make a difference. Um, I don't know how many of you have done this, but I think it's very important for the future to measure your VO2 max. And I'll talk about VO2 max in a second. But one of the things that I think is very important to do is to have quite a lot of cordyceps. There's different kinds of cordyceps. This is one. I've tried many things. So when I was in high school, I would run quite a lot. I ran up to 100 miles a week. And the fastest mile I was able to run was a 420. And then I did some dumb things uh, and uh, injured myself and then stopped running. And then I couldn't get back into it. Uh, two years ago, I was able to get back and get my mile back down to a five-minute mile. And I know if you work with kilometers, that's 1.6 uh, kilometers. It's not a meaningful measure, but it's like a you know maybe 10 seconds, 20 seconds longer to run a mile than a 1,500 meter. And I think one of the things that helped me do that is working out twice a day at Orange Theory with a heart rate monitor. But the other thing is that I was drinking cordyceps tea all the time. So cordyceps is one of those things that's quite amazing. It's expensive if you get the real stuff, but it does help you raise the oxygen level that you have. Uh, pre prednisone and glucagon also does it. Um, and then what you want to have, you want to try to over, over time. And remember, I'm not just talking about the next few weeks. Remember, I talked about the 632 days between now and 2022. So even if it's blocked in one case, it's still getting oxygen from another. And finally, there's the capacity of the blood to carry oxygen, which is a function of hemoglobin. And also, if you take uh, certain kinds of drugs like Lance Armstrong was doing, or you're up at altitude, there's EPO. So there are ways that you can tent your bed. This is one of the best biohacks that you could do, is you tent your bed, you have the, and then you basically reduce the oxygen a little bit each night. And then you, so there's an idea called um, sleeping high and training low. And the idea of sleeping high means that you're sleeping in a tent that has reduced oxygen, giving your blood a chance to do that. But then when you go out and you work out, you're supercharged. And so one of the things about COVID-19 is it's characterized by a reduction in one or more of these things. And it could be all four of these. So COVID-19 can hurt all of these. Um, it can just diminish the tidal volume. It can diminish the bronchial efficiency. It can uh, diminish your heart health. And it, it, this is the big thing, is it can diminish the ability of the red blood cells to carry as much oxygen. I'll show you a gross picture of that. So what you want to do is, if you don't already have one, you want to have one of these pulse oximeters. And these were $20 uh, just two weeks ago on Amazon. But as it's gotten out, that the, the basic thing that people are dying of is extreme hypoxia they lack oxygen. 
And so you want to get this. Now, uh, you want to have this be pretty high, 96, 97, 98. You know, it's easy for us who use Fahrenheit because basically you want your temperature and you want your oximeter to be about the same, you know, 98.6. Uh, but uh, if it gets below, uh, I heard someone say that the, 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 um, the first speaker who had the, uh, uh, a very wonderful and long talk, I think she said 92. I would start to be concerned at 95. So just before I started this, I had a friend message me and say, hey, my, my pulse oximeter said 92. And this is a person who had just done two days ago a hyperbaric chamber. So to me, he, need, he needs to seek some medical attention because it's dropping fast. To me, that's an indicator. I should also thank the previous speaker because he hosted me and I did the hyperbaric chamber of his in Chelsea in London. And it's a, it was a great experience. I think that it, uh, every biohacker should have uh, oxygen therapy capability. And this is a picture of an oxygen concentrator. I myself bought an oxygen concentrator. I have it. Uh, my, I also have one for my girlfriend who has a separate apartment. So we each have our, our oxygen concentrators and we have extra cannulas, the things that can go up the nose. And this is actually not a bad thing to do on a regular basis. So this is well, one of the things that you want to do to get through the next few years is just make sure that no matter what happens to the system that you have things to keep. And you also want to have a battery backup just in case the power goes out. And so you can use an oxygen, uh, this oxygen concentrator for therapy. It will increase the recovery time if you've done an intense workout. And you want to also drink oxygenated water. There's something called cocoon. It's from Hungary. It's, called, uh, it's spelled K-A-Q-U-N, uh, cocoon. And cocoon has this hyper-oxygenated water. They also have these hyper-oxygenated baths. Uh, with a special hyperoxygenated water. They're blue. It's very interesting looking. But in LA, that's seen as a non-essential business. It's closed. But that helps people with the problem of hypoxia. And so also nebulizer masks. Uh, here's, a, here's what a nebulizer mask uh, looks like. Um, basically, you put the albuterol sulfate in here and you basically get it going over here. And uh, you want to uh, buy albuterol. And if you can get extra albuterol, I would highly recommend doing that. So this is the kind of thing that if hospitals are overwhelmed uh, and you need to take care of somebody and can't have them in a hospital, people who are over the age of 60 have been turned away from hospitals in Italy and Spain. Many of them have died. I think if they had these at home, I'm not saying that they would have survived, but they would have had a better chance of survival. Okay, another thing is that you want to use an inhaler uh, to open up your lungs. You can get that albuterol sulfate. That's the thing that, that the person is using in the lower right there. And uh, I want to show you this. This is uh, my mask. You want to have in your mask, you want to take a paper towel or a handkerchief and you want to put it in there and then to uh, have uh, thieves oil. So this is thieves oil and thieves oil is rosemary, eucalyptus, cloves, and basically it's got a in my mind, a really nice smell. And you basically just dose your mask like this. And then when I'm going out, I'm breathing. I have this extra layer, this extra filter of this moist cloth with the thieves oil. And thieves oil is something that uh, somebody will say, oh, but that's antibacterial. Yeah, but it's also antiviral. So some things that are antibacterial by coincidence are antiviral. A lot of the plants that have been around for a while survive because they get attacked by viruses too. And so they develop antiviral properties, random mutation, natural selection. The plants that are here today were able to fight off viruses. There are many plant species that are extinct because they couldn't fight off viruses. So use plants when you can. And they claim it kills 99.96% of bacteria and viruses. Um, thieves oil is what the people put in, uh, they put botanicals, not uh, oils, but basically they would crush the rosemary and other things and put it in cloth and then they would stick that long nose of the beak so if you see that scary mask from the black death from the plague that's people making their own thieves oil equivalents from botanicals and putting that in also if you um if you can't get thieves oil because a lot of it's sold out you can just get clove oil i actually have uh i actually have more than a gallon uh, at home i have big cans of oil that i've kept again thinking for the next uh, two years. Uh, but clove oil, rosemary oil, eucalyptus oil are the things you want to put in your mask. So, and this is another thing too, is that uh, the, sorry for the spelling error there, uh, but this is this, if you look at this blood, I don't know if you can see it, but it's basically black blood. 
So what's happened is that the SARS-CoV-2 is going and attacking, attacking the hemoglobin and knocking out its ability to carry oxygen. It's knocking out the iron. And part of what damages the lungs is that you have all this iron just precipitating out. And imagine that you put a bunch of little tiny iron filings and you put them in your lungs. So this is what this blood draws. It's uh, dark, black in color, and hypoxia could explain this. And then you also have before and after ozone autohemotherapy. So if you are worried about it, you can get this therapy and you can possibly even do this kind of stuff at home. Uh, and one of the things that uh, men should be testing is you should test your ferritin iron. So women uh, menstruate. They basically exsanguinate. They, every a woman who has her period is you know, uh, losing blood every month. And when she does that, she's giving up excess iron. Men can accumulate iron and without exsanguination, the iron accumulates. And right now you have people who are, have a better survival rate because they give blood. But one reason the people who give blood have a better survival rate is because they're dumping their excess iron. So if you've thought any time that there now is as good a time as any to give blood, um, I would not recommend, I mean, you can't give it while you're sick. You shouldn't give it while you're sick. But in particular, people who have had this and have antibodies uh, that their blood will be worth more than its weight in gold. Okay, now we're going to talk about antiviral measures. And we, what we want to do is reduce viral load. Yes, of SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19, yeah, uh, which are the start. symptoms. Uh, and what we also okay, want to do so, is other viruses, because viruses so now are, we're going to, have been around for okay, a billion and a half years. Talk about antiviral and they've had a measures. lot to do with and our what evolution. What we want to do is reduce so the viral, viral load, load, as other speakers yes, have said, but not everybody has heard every talk, so I'll repeat it. SARS viral load is the total amount of virus a person has inside them. Symptoms. And, uh, and to prevent and infection, you need to reduce your viral load. If you're in a crowded space with a lot of people and they're not wearing masks and they're touching each other, they're at weddings, they're hugging each other, you're getting a much bigger viral load. Or if you're in churches, you can get that. And one of the things that we haven't talked about because it's indelicate, but I'm not that delicate, so I'll talk about it, is fart plumes. So the, you basically somebody can fart and it can actually go out 30 feet or about uh, 10 meters and it can infect people. Your farts are very infectious if you have this. Also, if you use a public toilet and there's still something left in the bowl, which there probably is, you can get it from that as well. So you don't want to use public toilets, as the first speaker said. And you also don't want to be around where people are going to do it. The average person is farting two to five times an hour. So if you go to one of these big churches and they have all the windows closed, you're going to be basically sitting and marinating in each other's infected farts. Somebody in a big church with thousands of people is going to have it. So it's crazy for people to want to go out in public and sit next to each other with other people. I'm sorry if that sounds very gross, but the, the, this whole virus thing is gross. And dying is the grossest thing of all. However, uh, so you do want to wear gloves and you do want to wear masks, but you definitely don't want to be around standing in front of somebody face to face and talking with them. And I'm shocked and amazed that in grocery stores in Los Angeles, there are still grocers doing their holding all that stuff, moving it around, uh, going with shopping carts, moving them all around, and not having masks and not having gloves. So uh, there are basically, you wanna wash your hands all the time, you wanna cover your mouth, but that's not enough. Ultimately, if we're talking about a long thing, you should get your thymus measured. So I was part of the initial parts of this Stanford study about regrowing the thymus. The thymus can be regrown, and the thymus constitutes the prim for, uh, primary lymphoid organ for the generation of T cells. As the last speaker said, uh, uh, this is, you know, the thymus cells. These immune system cells help to ward off infection. And elders have a higher fatality rate uh, since thymus and bone marrow produce less of the B cells and T cells, which are key players. So they're produced in the bones and then they go and they attach themselves to the thymus, which is kind of like a mini upside down heart above the heart. And then it, it has to stay on the surface for about a day or two. And it's a finishing school for the immune system. But what happens is that it's big, like a California strawberry before puberty. So you all had your biggest uh, thymuses when you were uh, basically between 10, 11, 12 or so. But when you have puberty, for women, they get a lot more estrogen. For, for boys, they get a lot more testosterone. And unfortunately, testosterone and estrogen degrade it. Now, one of the things that we're going to probably see in ruthless countries, uh, you know the kinds I'm talking about probably, they're going to grab 
uh, thymuses and they're going to rip them out and they're going to do thymus transplants, but they have to figure out because it's not the same immune system. But I think that the single, if I were Donald Trump and I had biohackers advising, I would put uh, as much money as it took into 3D printing the thymus, and then I would make it available for the public that anybody over the age of 50 could get their thymus measured. And if it was small, and most of them are, they can get it replaced with a new thymus. So making a new uh, synthetic thymus, uh, and it, you want to have it be, of course, with your stem cells and you know be attuned to your immune system. But that's would be the biggest thing we could do to save lives. One of the problems that a lot of that that people have, and I cannot believe that uh, medical people aren't talking about it, is that they treat symptoms and not causes. And normally, that's the kind of thing that sounds like it's uh, it's just exaggeration. But I'll prove it. Seventy percent of people have herpes simplex one, and seventy percent of people have. This is globally, worldwide. So we're talking if there are eight billion people, and there are that there were 4.8 billion. So let's say 5 billion people have herpes simplex one and 5 billion people have cytomegalovirus. And these things tax the immune system because you have all these T cells and B cells, natural killer cells and so on. And they're taxed by being eroded. So it's eroding your immune system. And when your thymus is not functioning because you're older, you're over the age of 50, especially if you're over the age of 60 or 70, you know, you want to keep those as much as possible. So I'm not a doctor. But I will tell you that laboratory tests have shown that BHT, which is a food preservative, it's commonly available, can help you to get rid of, of herpes simplex one. Basically erodes the, the covering, just like you want to wash your hands to get rid of the covering of uh, SARS-CoV-2. And the treatment for cytomegalovirus is valacyclovir or Valtrex. Now, I'm not telling you any medical things, don't do things based on me, but you can talk to your doctor and you, you can sometimes get prescribed these things, uh, 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 Valtrex or Valacyclovir, because these are broad spectrum antivirals. So um, the basic idea is that you get rid of the viral load, the overall viral load, freeing up your immune system to take on SARS-CoV-2. So another thing that you want, other speakers have, have mentioned it uh, intelligently, uh, is you want to have your probiotics. And they're, the latest numbers that I've seen are that we have 27 trillion of our cells, and then we have 23 trillion microorganisms in our body there. But they're much smaller uh, than than we are, you know. Those the, so they don't take up. But they they uh, they con the, the gut bacteria constitute about 10 percent of our body weight, and you want to have it be friendly bacteria that will go in and duke it out with other things that are that you don't want in your body. And so you uh. You want, I take the, the strongest probiotic I can, take it each day. I think it makes a big difference. Um, but I have heard doctors say that another great way to build your immune system, and this is before COVID, you probably don't want to do this now unless you're way out in the country and there are no people around, uh, but uh, smelling flowers. So once this is over or once you have the antibodies, uh, you want to try different kinds of foods and you want to smell different kinds of things. And I think that the Dutch habit of having a lot of fresh flowers I think has been very smart. I think it's been probably had a big impact on their health because if you're smelling different kinds of flowers, then you're getting different kinds of things that uh, build up your gut bacteria. You want to make sure that your body is tending towards being alkaline and you don't want to make it acidic. So you want to get rid of sugar. It's also a source of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and uh, adipose tissue. And you want to, it also can hurt the, the immune system. Now, there is an exception because I'm talking about fructose, I'm talking about glucose, those, you know, high fructose corn syrup, et cetera. But there is a sugar that helps you. So one of the things that we're going to talk about in a minute is autophagy. But since we're on sugar, I'm just going to say this. Trehalose is a naturally occurring in plants, mushrooms, uh, insects, and shrimp. And it's like sucrose, but it's a non-reducing disaccharide. And uh, it's basically the how insects have their sugar. And of course, you know that Ants have legendary uh, strength to body weight. And so trehalose is one of those things that uh, engenders autophagy, self-eating. You also want to have lots of Chinese herbal tea. Uh, Chinese, uh, the, these kind of things, cordyceps, you can have a tea. I mentioned that before. Uh, reishi, uh, lion's mane, those are, are good. And you want to have these methyl xanthines. Uh, so I, there's fungal tea and then there's herbal tea. So what I'm suggesting is that you want to have a lot of fungal tea 
for the things that help to boost your immune system. And you want to have a lot of herbal tea. So part of the reason that there are so many more people in India and China was not that they were always so large, but part of it was because tea is an antral, it is a natural antibiotic. And I highly recommend if you have time, if you go to Audible, there's a free book, if you're a member of Audible, that by Michael Pollan, uh, the guy who did Cooked and uh, The Botany of Desire and all that. And he has a thing on caffeine. Uh, it's, a, it's a short book. It's a couple hours. Highly recommend it shows how tea and coffee have changed the world. And so w- since w- uh, a previous speaker, uh, Slim Lan, talked about autophagy, I'll just go over it very briefly. But the idea is that autophagy is self-eating and that if you have cells that are infected and then you're triggering autophagy, your body is going to get rid of them. It's going to pack them up and get rid of them. And you also want to have uh, mitochondria uh, functional. So uh, mito- cancer cells have impaired mitochondria and they have they consume 800% more glucose. They're just sugar fiends. Give me sugar, give me sugar. And you can starve them. So if you're on the ketogenic diet and you're in ketosis, then you can, the the cells, uh, especially cells in your brain can only eat two things. They can eat glucose or they can eat free fatty acids. And basically being in ketosis means that you're starving your body of sugar. So to the extent that you can make it work and be in ketosis, um, I don't know that you, because there's this keto flu, I don't, you have to talk to your doctor or other nutritionists and not a nutritionist, but I have, uh, I have found quite a lot of benefit from doing things to trigger autophagy. And so There are a number of ways to trigger autophagy. And uh, so one of them is intermittent fasting. So you just eat within a certain window each day. This is the most basic thing about biohacking. So I'm sure that most of you have heard this a thousand times. I apologize, but it may be that there's one person here who hasn't heard it. I want them to hear it. Another thing is that is fasting. So there was an article in Scientific American by a person who I was sort of presented as the world expert in fasting. And he fasts four days a week out of seven. So he eats three days and then he fasts four days. That's pretty extreme, but man, is he having quite a lot of autophagy. Uh, And then longer term fasting, there are some people who go every year for religious reasons and for others, and they don't eat for two or three weeks. Um, And then also exercise. If you do quite a lot of exercise, particularly if you exercise on an empty stomach, then you're going to be engendering autophagy. And a ketogenic diet triggers autophagy. And then there are specific supplements like L-carnosine, benfodiamine, L-citrulline, quercetin, DMAE, and NAD. And in other things, there are people who have said for COVID-19 that uh, uh, NAD is something and L-citrulline is something you should have. So that's probably why. And then as we discussed, trehalose. And then the last thing is that, and you, you do this as metformin. Now, my experience with uh, my experience is that metformin can cause uh, a a drop in your VO2 max because it can negatively affect your mitochondria. But again, talk with a doctor, go in and test, 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 be a fanatic for the quantified self and do your own measurements. So I personally am sorry I ever took metformin because it really changed my performance from one day to the next. So also uh, there, one thing to think about right now is remember when you want to get through the next two years. You want other people to get through the next two years too, because if people are dying around you for whatever reason, then that makes a big difference. So there are food shortages of food and toilet paper. I don't know if there are shortages of toilet paper everywhere, but 78% of Americans are overweight and 38% are obese. And so fasting is good for that. Um, And the idea is that you want to make sure if you're fasting, that you uh, don't, uh, that you have a lot of water or tea or juice, um, but it, but the idea is just to stop eating, and it's more natural. USC has said that you can regenerate your entire immune system in 72 hours. So one of the things that you want to do long, longer term is you want to have antiviral coatings. So these coatings are effective against the virus, and copper and silver are very effective. But so um, I'm actually going to be uh, working with my girlfriend and her father, who's a a, a very famous chemist, very accomplished, and making some coatings that uh, have antiviral properties. And you also, one of the things that you want to see, you probably have seen this slide. If you look down below, uh, you see this is a societies with masks. This is the death rate in societies. Uh, you know, basically, number of cases is here on the, uh, the y-axis. 
and then the days since hitting 100 cases. So those societies which were wearing masks before, mainly because of SARS, but uh, also because of shyness. So it's very, very common for people to wear masks in Japan, Taiwan, Singapore, and China. So when this whole thing came out, day one, they already had a bunch of masks in their homes. Number two, it's a fact that China delayed telling uh, us about this, and they had people going around the world and buying up masks. And so part of the problem is that you had people who already had masks grab a bunch of the masks from Australia and the US and from, from the UK and other places. So uh, one of the things uh, that's coming out here is that you want to have the mask, you want to wear the mask, and you want to wear the mask even if you don't think that it's going to make a big difference. And then we have the efficiency of protective masks. Some masks are doing much better than others. And then we're coming into the home stretch here, uh, supplements. Uh, melatonin, children age nine and under produce about 10 times the melatonin of adults age 70. And you want to have vitamin C, uh, nitric acid, uh, vitamin D, citrulline, uh, omega-3, zinc, and quercetin. These are all things that are sort of the, the basics. And then supplements, biohacking, uh, vitamin C, vitamin D. You might want to, if you can, though many of these places are closed, but uh, I was before about once a month, I was getting intravenous uh, vitamins, including a mega dose of vitamin C. I think it makes a big difference. And then there's also some things that Russians recommend, like mildronate, also called meldonium, which will increase your, uh, your hemoglobin. Again, check with a doctor, check with other people, but I think that this is the golden age of open source medicine. So you should definitely look into that. And I think lastly, uh, as, we, as we go here, this is my last information slide besides my contact information. I think biohackers, as I said before, have a very important role to play in helping people. So there is this online science coalition, one, just one giant lab starting their own research. Um, I coined the term open source medicine back in the year 2009 or so in the H+, Humanity Plus magazine. And uh, the idea is that, that you, we want to have share as much medical information as possible. So we have students and scientists and developers and health professional, and then sharing all this information and basically, we also want to share information about what there, there are a ton of treatments that are going to be rushed to market that are not going to have the normal kind of testing. So we have to be more vigilant than ever about all this. Um, that, that's my presentation. I hope this helps you survive. And then here's my uh, contact information, alexleitman at me.com, uh, facebook.com slash alexleitman. I have a YouTube channel. And there's my Twitter, Alex Lightman. So thank you, Timu. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me this great opportunity to share this information. And uh, thank you for dedicating your life to providing uh, this useful information to people. I find your work to be extraordinary. And the Biohackers Handbook is one of the most beautiful information-rich books I've seen. So it's an honor to be on your program and be part of your community. I have, I have a few questions for you, Alex. Um, so you have been following a lot of different trends uh, around COVID-19, but one of your top expertise is also the financial markets, um, cryptocurrencies, and so on. I would love to hear your take on uh, the financial markets. Like in short, do you think uh, we are moving into electronic currencies? Uh, is paper money getting out faster? Uh, is there some agendas, let's say, on government level? Uh, I know that XRP is used between banks now to transfer money and so on. So like, how do you see uh, kind of um, the, the future of money here right now? Well, there's been there. So the original uh, Genesis block of Bitcoin had in it a newspaper, Chancellor bails out banks. And so part of the, the idea here, because we have to read between the tea leaves since nobody's able to interview Satoshi Nakamoto and know that it's him or her or them. Uh, is that, you know, the idea is that these bailouts of banks means that eventually you destroy money. One of the longest wiki pages on Wikipedia is of dead currencies, currencies that used to be national currencies. And so it's not widely known, but in the US, we had two national currencies that are both dead. I've never heard an American talk about the continental, but what happens is that you have a currency and then people get control of the printing press and they just go crazy printing money for crazy things. And then they, uh, and then they basically uh, they, they trash the currency, and then they just move to a new one. 
And so what we see right now is people going insane printing money, and it's kind of it's giving it to cronies. So we have this book called Why Nations Fail. And Why Nations Fail, it's a book about that thick, it's 500 pages or so. And the guys say, when the extractive class gets control of the printing press and you can't stop them, if you can't stop the extractive class from just plundering the treasury, that's why nations fail. And so we are in the United States and to a lesser extent other countries living out that, that, that uh, scenario. Now, the United States has a little bit more time than others because we have the reserve currency, 63 and a half percent of all of the international transactions are in the dollar, but every dog has his day. And the Chinese have had a plan to uh, be the reserve currency by 2025. I don't think they'll achieve it, but there's a plan out there. And so what's happened is that uh, governments realize they don't really want to spread uh, this SARS-CoV-2 through paper money and through change. So they're going to move to it. And you see these cut, these places where they don't use cash having better mortality numbers. So what you're going to find is every country that's using a lot of cash is going to now ramp up using payments through apps and through mobile phones that are contactless and where you can just do these things without people touching and, and holding money that can, that can hold coronavirus. And then in addition to that, the, an even bigger thing is that people will want something that is non-correlated, non-correlated assets, because countries are blowing their treasuries right now. And what we see out of all this is that we're going to have big medical expenses. And I'll tell you two things that, that I haven't seen anyone figure out yet. One, the United States cost of health care per capita is $13,500 per person per year. And that's going to probably this year go more than $20,000 per person per year. Only 50 to 55 million people in the United States are net taxpayers. I have no idea how we afford that in the long run. Also, a lot of the impact of, of COVID-19 can be long term. And this idea that hydroxychloroquine and z and zinc are great, well, those don't confer immunity. Those don't magically make immune cells in your body. So it's not building up your immune system. And there are mutations of these things. So overall, medical expenses are going to go up. And another thing is that what the basis for credit is, uh, is basically hypothecating future earnings and things. So we started keeping track. We know what this great flu in London did because people were dying and the, t and the government wanted to see what was happening to its tax collectors and things. And so as a result, uh, I think that if this, unless this, this whole treatment comes quickly, I think we could see a reduction in the life expectancy of baby boomers in the United States of between one and three years. And they're the ones who hold the real estate assets. So if they're dying and they're dumping their properties and nobody's buying them, then we have a real estate crash. In China, 73% of the GDP growth since 2000 has been in real estate. So I think if we have a lot of older people owning real estate and the real estate, the wealthy people who own real estate dying, you're going to dump it. You're going to have supply because young people who, one, don't have the money to buy these things. And number two, um, they don't want, don't want, want to have big spaces. And so um, I can also ultimately see all kinds of different crashes coming out of this. And I can see people wanting to uh, with government is going to start forcing people to have vaccinations. Some people are eager for the vaccination. Some people are not. But ultimately, there are going to be a growing number of people who want to use cryptocurrency because they don't want to feed the beast of government. Right. So I see a bright future for, for big brand name cryptocurrencies. Okay. So if you think of um, the different measures that will be in place after the coronavirus kind of peak has uh, subsidized, and many governments will try to take advantage of the situation for for different reasons. But what are the measures that you see that will remain in in effect? Like after nine eleven, the number we, we have we yes. have we have after nine and nine eleven we have had like at airports checking liquids and so on. So what are the measures that you see in addition to maybe having a certificate if you are immune to coronavirus? What 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 do you see will be kind of the I measures that, that will that be in place? Temperature scans, oxygen scans, certificates on your phone that say what all the things that you've had and what you have immunities to will make a difference. And it'll make a difference to what clubs you get into, 
uh, what facilities that you get into. You want to go in the gym, you have to show it. Already in China, they're already taking people's temperature, but people can fake temperatures. You, there's things that you can take to change your temperature. Or, you know, we just had several people talk about taking ice baths. Well, let's say you have a temperature, but you want to go into someplace. You get into an ice bath, and then you quickly go to this place that you want to go to. Or you just simply put an ice pack on your head right before you do this. It's like, oh, my God, you know, you're, you're 10 degrees below normal. Yeah, you know. So mm. I can see all kinds of measures and countermeasures being set up. But the main thing that will last is tracking you uh, 24-7 through your mobile phone. Right. And, uh, and of course, there is this oldest ID 2020 thing, which uh, other people know more about than I do, but I, but I do make apps and that, and these, and this whole thing, there is a demand for governments and pretty much the ones who are bidding on these contracts are Facebook, Google, and the Chinese companies that are tracking people for China. Like those are about the only people bidding on these contracts for the most part. So we're going to, we're going to have it all tied together with the ad making machinery and other kinds of things. Like the giants, the technology giants now are going to now use this as their way to punch through the wall into electronic medical records. I worked for the Obama White House and I was shocked by how often Google was getting meetings with the White House. So Google met with the White House over 200 times and I was going, what could they possibly be talking about? Well, one of the things they were talking about was how you could do electronic medical records. And so I think that, that the lasting thing, because these companies are so big, is Google, Facebook, and the Chinese app companies that, and the payments companies all blurring the line between government and jailer and app provider and uh, passports and all that as it all goes on to the mobile phone. Like everything is going to go on to the mobile phone, but the phone, mobile phone can track you. It, um, when, when I think about this, uh, it reminds me of you know the kind of good old story of people getting microchipped and um the, that's the, not the, just a story it's it's it, there are lots of people who want to have that happen yeah and, uh, and i mean because they want to make money i mean that's kind of the biggest fear of people who don't really know what microchips are possible today and what the kind of biohacking chips are actually doing those are mostly passive ones for uh identification and maybe maybe linking you to have a, a moore's law you're mm. going to have a moore's law of these chips and the yeah. thing about 5g is that it has much it has a spatial division so there's a much higher density of base stations and antennas so it makes things that used to be impossible because the antennas and the towers were too far away it makes it much more possible absolutely but but having said that probably before you get a chip uh, your mobile device is the one that's the chip basically that's the thing that tracks you around that's the thing that you need to keep on when you leave your home that's the thing that has all kinds of sensors on it. And those go beyond things that we can put under the skin right now. Well, and they may have a, a rule that you have the chip and then the chip has to be able to be read by your phone, which is registered with you. And so you have to have your phone with you and that there's a signal if your phone is not near your chip. And so that's how you basically get this gain of function from these biochips. Right. There is a great movie called uh, G-A-T-T-A-C-A, Gattaca, that kind of goes into... Um, basically a dystopian world where we all have genetic code mapped out at birth. And based on that, your, the rest of your life is decided upon. So we'll see how these things unfold. I, I'm a protector of the free world, and I hope that we will be able to you know, keep on experimenting and advancing science and technology uh, without some forces trying to you know control us with it uh, but that's always the double-edged word that's the that's you know uh, well, how I, things are yeah well i just want to say that i think it's very important to have a very rich biohacking community rich in the sense of rich in expertise and knowledge and sharing because then when somebody comes along who's a monopolist who went to the supreme court and was said you have violated antitrust laws the idea that we're having this big push like cattle down a chute to give a, the only guy I know of in recent history who, I mean, there aren't that many people who went to the U.S. Supreme Court and they said, yes, you're a monopoly. You're using unfair practices to destroy your competition. Stop it. That's illegal, right? The only, you know, why would we let that person be in charge of a monolithic vaccination? Why not have a hundred different vaccinations and then see who dies faster or who, who gets better? Like, let's, let's keep on doing that. So what I like about 
biohacking is that there's no uh, po biohacking pope who, determine, who decrees that he's infallible about biohacks. And the idea is that you have to learn for yourself and try it out and share your data. And that's what I see from the last two days is that people were sharing their, their, their experiences, their data. And there was a, there was a really nice mix of, of head and heart. And I don't see that in these mass things. Everybody must get vaccinated. And I think it's worth mm -hmm. also pointing out, it, look at the actual results of injuries from the Gates Foundation and what they've, what they've done. And so it's not like there's this unblemished record where every vaccine had no harm. There's plenty of harm. So I, you know, sometimes you don't want to make the treatment worse than the than the underlying condition. Right. Wonderful. So uh, we're going to continue with the program uh, with our last presentation. Thank you very much, Alex, for joining Thank us. You. This was great. Bye, Timu, Thank and you. Bye, uh, bye, biohacker community. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. You're part of it. Uh, like everyone else, we we want to bring different opinions in and uh, Alex was definitely a, a light in the end of the tunnel uh, in terms of like how we can take our own health into our own hands and become more informed, better informed in, in ways how we can, uh, you know, even protect things like oxygen in our blood. And um, maybe that's exercise, maybe that's measuring it with devices like this.